point of letting you know he's in the overflow room. So he didn't skip out this morning, okay? So they're watching from over next door. If you find your place in John chapter 5, we've been looking through the book of John, and we've come to chapter 5, and I think in a sense chapter 5, there's a place here, there is a sort of a turning point here in this book, really one of my favorite chapters. I want to read there, and we'll not deal with the whole chapter, of course, but a text. And right before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, I we thank you this morning for the opportunity we have to be in this service, for the opportunity to share the Word of God, to listen to these songs that remind us of our Lord Jesus. We pray that you would look at the need of each heart this morning. Many believers that need to be encouraged and strengthened. There are perhaps those who do not know Christ this morning that need to be challenged with their need. May everything that we see done this morning bring honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray it in his name. Amen. In John chapter 5, of course, it begins with the man by the pool who is healed, and it comes down in the controversy that it stirs, begins down in verse 16. It says, Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now, of course, he had healed this man on the Sabbath day and had told him to take up his bed and walk. It would offend them that Jesus would have even done a miracle on the Sabbath day, which is ironic because God established the Sabbath. And obviously, if God heals a man, then God's okay with instituting and breaking his own law. But they would be offended by that. They were more highly offended that he had instructed this man on the Sabbath day to take up his bed and to walk. So they're stirred about the fact that Jesus had done this. Jesus says in verse 17, he answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Now therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Do you know if you were to look back when the Sabbath was typified in chapter 1 of the book of Genesis when Jesus of God of course made the earth in six days and it says he rested on the seventh day. Now after that seventh day man had been created and of course man in the next chapter in chapter 3 sins against God and the Sabbath rest ended. God had rested until man sinned and he began to work. His work was to bring about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he would accomplish on the cross to take care of man's sin. Jesus goes back and alludes to that and says, My father worketh hitherto to this point, and I work. Now the Jews may not have fully comprehended all that Jesus meant by his work, but they did notice that he included a little word that you don't see in the English, but it's an emphasis in the original language. He added the word that means his own. He wasn't simply saying that God is my Father, like we might say, our Father which art in heaven. But he literally added the emphasis to say that God is my own Father. Now, if there's any question as to what he meant, the Jews fully understood the impact, and they sought more to stone him, Because they said, did you hear what he just said? Did you hear the statement that Jesus just made? He's not claiming merely to be a prophet. He is not just claiming that he's come to fulfill some type of a prophecy. Hey, he claims that he's equal with God. Now that was their argument against him. There, of course, is quite a discourse that takes place between Jesus and these men. And they begin to talk about his case for that and why he can strengthen his case and say that he is equal with the Father. If you'll notice down, it comes into verse 32. And Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now notice carefully in verse 31, he says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, Jesus didn't mean that he would tell a lie. He is simply saying that if I say that I'm who I say I am, you have a legitimate reason to say, well, anybody can claim to be Christ. Anybody could come up and say, I am God. And if you think that's not true, the law of Moses said by two or three witnesses, let every word be established. He said, if I bear witness of myself, it would be legitimate for you to reject it. However, in verse 32, there is another 
that beareth witness of me, and I know the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. And he goes on to give not one, but multiple witnesses as to who he is. Now it's certainly enough, knowing his reputation, that the Lord Jesus Christ would say that he is the Son of God. You know, many men have come up and said that they were essentially the Son of God. Uh, in our own time, we've got men, I remember back, I guess it was the late 80s, early 90s, uh, David Koresh claimed to be some type of Messiah. Of course, he had a little following, went down to Texas, and people believed that, and a group of people uh, said, I understand what he's claiming, we accept that, and of course we know, obviously, he's not the Christ. You'll remember back from the 70s, I suppose it was, Jim Jones, well-known man who had a thousand followers that followed him over to a, an African country and, uh, you know, all of them drank poison Kool-Aid just because he told them to do it. He claimed to be, as it were, the Son of God or a Messiah. Uh, there's been others through the years who have claimed some type of a deity. And obviously, if a man rose up today and said, I am Christ, I am the Son of God, it would be legitimate, in fact necessary, for us to reject him for saying that. Now Jesus looks at these men and says, first of all, you ought to be able to recognize who I am for all the prophecies that I fulfilled. I mean, where he was born, the place that he lived, all that had taken place, but he said for sake of argument, if I bear witness of myself, you could say that my witness is not true. He said, so let me follow this idea and let me make a case for who I am. Let me just this morning, if I can, from this chapter, very simply, make a case for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't need to this morning to go back and maybe come from human reasoning or some type of an apologetic standpoint to convince you that Jesus is the Son of God. As Jesus points out, He has power enough through His Word to demonstrate who He is. No doubt this morning the majority of us know the Lord Jesus Christ, know who He is, and yet I'm brought back this morning to focus on Him and recognize that I'm not just shooting in the wind. I have a foundation upon which I can stand. I literally serve the living God. I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the case is certainly not going to be exhaustive. There's much more that can be said. But I want you to follow, if you would, for a moment, almost as if we were in a courtroom. Almost as if you were the jury and I would be the person to simply present to you the evidence and if you follow it, you cannot dispute the fact simply Jesus must be who he says he is. You know, I notice here he brings up several different types of witnesses. Now one, he begins off very simply. You look at verse 33. He says, you sent unto John and he bear witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He said, I didn't need John the Baptist to necessarily testify, but let's just bring him up for a moment. You know what I'm going to call John the Baptist is a, prov a provocative witness. God used him for a specific reason to get people to stop and think we need somebody like Jesus to show up. Now, if we go into the courtroom this morning, let's look at John the Baptist and let's just say... This provocative witness is our expert. Now, we have to, of course, establish the fact that he's an expert, and I'm not going to turn you to these passages, but for instance, in Mark chapter 11 and verse uh, 32, the enemies of, of John themselves recognized that John was a prophet. As a matter of fact, they were questioned by Jesus, is the, is the preaching of John from men or is it from heaven? And they would not answer his question. They got together in a group, reasoned among themselves, and says, you know, we can't answer that question. If we say from heaven, he's going to say, why didn't you listen to him? If we say he's from men, we're going to get in trouble. And they said this because all men recognize John the Baptist is a prophet. Hey, the enemies of Jesus said that we accept his credentials. We accept the fact that all men consider John the Baptist a prophet. So what did John the Baptist do? We know from Matthew chapter 3, for instance, that John the Baptist came to prepare the way of the Lord. He came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, God looked down at this world and recognized our need. They needed to be aware of their need. And you know, it isn't difficult today to look at this world and recognize they need Jesus. This world needs what Christ has to offer. You know, John the Baptist came preaching, 
and he stood as a picture of God's law. Now, do you know today people need to know what God's standard is? They need to know what the law says. The law can never save, but certainly the law can confront. You know, we live in a day where it's been brushed under the rug. It's maybe not considered that uh, socially unacceptable, but it's still wrong, for instance, to commit adultery. The Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, whoso committeth adultery, uh, or uh, Proverbs 6 actually, whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. And in Hebrews 13, adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. Now I understand the world is filled with immorality. Folks uh, live together outside of marriage, cheat on their spouse, throw morals out the window. Hey, they just need Christ. They need to be saved. They need Jesus. I get it. But it cannot be overlooked that God is still opposed to that sin. Hey, I realize today people's language is as gutter as it's ever been. I mean, never has there been a time in my life at least where you could walk into a public place and hear so much filth coming out of men's mouths. Now, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of God, I'd be conversing with them. I'm no better than they, but they still need to know that God Almighty says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Hey, we need to understand no evil communication is supposed to proceed out of one's mouth. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The world needs to recognize where they stand. That's what John the Baptist did. John the Baptist came on the scene and told people, God's not pleased with your sin. God's not pleased with your rejection. He even told the king, he said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It got him thrown in jail, but it stirred the hearts of the people. Now, here is a man recognized as an expert witness. He comes up, and we ask John. John has been established by the critics of Jesus. All men consider you a prophet. Obviously, God's hand's on you. You're giving us God's word. We hadn't heard anybody for 400 years, and you've come on the scene. It's pretty well accepted. Everybody knows you're a prophet. Can you tell me what you think of Jesus? And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Well, John, I'm glad you think so highly of Jesus. Do you think he's almost as good a preacher as you are? Wait a minute. He must increase. I must decrease. Who did John the Baptist say Jesus was? He is the Lamb of God, the only one who can take away the sin of the world. So we've got an expert who's come and testified very simply, no question about it, he's a prophet. Jesus is who he says he is. Well, then Jesus brings up verse 36. He says, but I have a greater witness than that of John. He started off with the weakest witness, and he was pretty strong. He said, I'll bring the expert in, and you can listen to the expert, but I don't need a man to testify of me. He said, if you didn't like John, well, in verse 36, I have a greater witness than that of John for the works which your father hath given me to finish. The same works that I do bear witness of me that the father hath sent me. So I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to give you some powerful witness to who Jesus is. Jesus said, why don't you today look at my works? You say, well, now, we can't look at the works of Jesus today. We weren't here when he was here. We can't, they didn't take videos. We can't follow that. Well, very simply, the Bible is the only book that is held to the scrutiny that it's held to. Most other books are not, and yet it still, it can stand to the test. But you don't really know that Napoleon lived, except you've read what somebody wrote about it. You don't know anybody that knows anybody that knows anybody who had a great-grandpa that knows that Napoleon lived. But we pretty much believe he did because enough people, enough different avenues of writing. You could go back further and, and, and say, well, Alexander the Great, was he a made-up individual, a made-up character that somehow, well, we know Alexander lived because obviously the Greek culture impacted the world and it split in all these kingdoms and we can see not only the writings but the impact. Do you think Jesus didn't impact the world? Now, obviously anything we know, we know from what people have testified, so why don't we bring up some witnesses this morning, not all of them, wouldn't have time to do that, but why don't we bring up a few witnesses this morning that could tell us a little bit about the works of Jesus. Uh, For instance, why don't we bring up some eyewitnesses? I'm not one. What would you do if you went to a court of law? You didn't see the crime. You'd bring an eyewitness and say, can you tell me? Now, if one person comes up and says somebody did it, you may not believe it. You know, it's uh, 
interesting sometimes to hear testimony from people in a courtroom. You know, people will say, I'll tell you what, I was just driving along, and out of nowhere, the telephone pole was right in front of me. You know, it, it, they can tell the story to have their own perspective. You know, but the fact is, when you get several witnesses, and they all keep saying the same thing, you begin to come to the conclusion, something must have happened. You know, let's bring one of these witnesses up we've looked at in the previous weeks. What about Nicodemus? Now, I wouldn't say that Nicodemus was somebody who was friendly to the Lord Jesus Christ because he was part of the group of enemies that Jesus had. He was a Pharisee. However, he was honest enough in his heart that he saw Jesus, saw his work, saw his miracles, and he came to Jesus and he testified this. He came by night and he said, Jesus, I know that you are from God, for nobody could do these miracles except God be with him. So here we've got a witness who comes on the scene and says, I have visibly, with my eyes, seen Jesus. I've got no ax to grind. I've got nothing to prove. But when I saw him, I came to this conclusion, God's got to be with this man, for nobody can do these miracles except God be with him. Evidently, Nicodemus saw him do some miracles. Well, you know, you can move on to the next chapter. We talked about this uh, lady last, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before when I was here, the woman at the well. You know, she met Jesus, and of course, she didn't know who she was talking to. She came to him, and she did not literally see him do a physical miracle, but by talking to him, he said, Woman, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, and what I had to offer you, I could give you water, which you would never have to drink again. And she said, Evermore, give me this water. And you know what? He gave it to her. She didn't walk away with an extended limb. She didn't walk away with eyes that had been opened nor ears that could now hear. She walked away with a new heart, went back to town, and testified, he told me all that I ever did. Evidently, she believed he's who he said he was. She said, he told me things nobody could know but God, and he said them to me. Well, now, let's bring up another witness. What if we brought up the man in this very chapter, in chapter 5? This man was by the pool. He had been there over 30 years. He had not walked. He was waiting for the moving of the water, and he didn't even know who Jesus was. He couldn't get out and about, never heard him preach, but somebody showed up. He did not know who and said, take up your bed and walk. Well, you can't just tell a man who's lame to take up his bed and walk, but when Jesus speaks, there's enough power in his word for you to obey it. He said, take up your bed, and this man's legs were strengthened. He got up. And it was the Sabbath day, it didn't make any difference to him. When a man tells you to get up and take your bed and proves he can by healing your legs, he gets up and he takes it. Now the men came to him, and we ask this man, we bring him into the courtroom, we sit him down, and we say, Sir, tell us your story. Oh, I was sitting beside the pool, been there for years, waiting for somebody. I had no man to move me, no man to take me anywhere. In fact, nobody cared for my soul. And finally, one man came over, showed me some compassion. I thought maybe he was going to give me a handout, give me a little food, maybe wait around and help me to the water. He didn't need the water. He said, take up your bed and walk. And I did what he said. Well, who was it that did this? The man didn't really know at that time. He said, I don't really know. But look at chapter 5 and down to first, in verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews after he met him that it was Jesus which had made him whole. So here we have a man who says, I know now. I've met him. I recognize his face. I remember what he looked like, and he came and met me again, and it was Jesus who made me whole. Now, we have Nicodemus who said he's seen his works. We had the woman by the well who heard the words of Jesus. He knew everything she thought, did, or said. We see the man by the pool who said, yes, it was him. We haven't got there yet, but in chapter 9, here's a man who's never seen anything. And the first sight that he ever sees is the face of Jesus. He was born blind. This man had been blind all his life, and the first time he hears this compassionate voice, and the man, uh, his eyes are open, and he sees the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, he didn't know what Jesus looked like. Now, he didn't know precisely at that time that it was Jesus who healed him. So the enemies of Jesus come and they bring him up and we'll ask him today, okay, sir, you've been blind from your birth. What happened? Well, I was there by the road and this man came by, of course, and he touched my eyes and the first face I saw was this fellow. Well, who is it? You know, wait a minute before you answer now. Don't get in tr trouble. Don't perjure yourself. Do you realize the man who claims he healed you is a deceiver and he claims to be the son of God and we don't like him? 
And the man says, well, whether he be the son of God or no, I don't know. But I know this, I was blind and now I see. Now that's the testimony from this man. Obviously, we could go on. You say, well, yeah, you're just talking to a bunch of people who Jesus healed. Obviously, if you know they're claiming they got healed, they're just preaching to the choir. These are not really strong witnesses. Well, they're pretty strong witnesses when they happen again and again and again and again. But let's just move over, not to people that are friends with Jesus. Nicodemus begged the body of Jesus after the cross and so forth. Let's go and look at some hostile witnesses. Why don't we bring up some witnesses for the devil's side? And ask them what they can say about him. You know, first of all, why don't we ask the Pharisees? In fact, you're right here in chapter 5. Look over to chapter 11 for a minute if you would. Now, you men, you're enemies of Christ. Yes, we are. You don't, you don't believe he's who he said? No. You, you'd like to see him shut down. Yeah, we wish we could. You don't want to hear him preach? No, he shouldn't be preaching. We don't want him around here. It's causing problems. Well, in chapter 11, these same group, verse 47... Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and says, what do we? They asked the question, what are we going to do about this man Jesus? Well, why are you asking that? For this man doeth many miracles. Oh, so you're, you don't care for Jesus, no. You, you'd like to see him shut down, sure. You don't believe he's who he says he is? Absolutely not. But you do admit you've seen him do many miracles. Well, yeah, I guess we can't deny that. Turn over to chapter 12. In chapter 12, Jesus heals a man. I should say heals. He raises a man from the dead who has been, uh, or in chapter 11, a man dead for four days. And, of course, the word gets around. And this man who was raised from the dead after being in the grave for four days, walking around, meeting people, people are seeing him. They went to his funeral. And there they show up five days later and say, wait a minute, I just attended your funeral, Lazarus. What are you doing here? Well, the Pharisees thought that caused a lot of problems. So we asked the same man again. Look, you said he did many miracles. You don't believe he's who he was? Oh, no. You don't want him to preach? No, I don't want him to preach. Well, notice in verse 10 of chapter 12, the chief priests, same group, consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Now, why did they want to put Lazarus to death? Why did people believe on Jesus through Lazarus? You know what they were basically saying? This man got raised from the dead. We need to kill him again. Now, the hostile witnesses of Jesus couldn't help but say, we know who he is. Look at chapter 7 of the book of John. Now, this same group wanted some authority, so they got some soldiers. They said, soldiers, I want you to go and bring Jesus back to us. We want to settle this thing. So the soldiers go. Now, you soldiers, you were out. You were trying to get Jesus. Uh, what did you think about Jesus? You don't like him, do you? Oh, no, we just wanted to arrest him. We're just doing what we told. We don't care a thing about them. We just wanted to do what we were asked to do. So in verse, uh, verse 44 of chapter 7, some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees and said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never a man. Spake like this man. So you heard Jesus speak. You knew when you heard his word there was something different about him. Well, we can't deny that. Yeah, they knew who he was. I'm not going to turn you over there for sake of time because there are other hostile witnesses, but let me mention one other. One other is a man named Pilate. Pilate was a tremendous interrogator, had the job often and would bring criminals in and question them and find out who was guilty, who was innocent. He was a shrewd lawyer, if you would, and he brought Jesus in. Now, Pilate, since you've got so much experience, since you've interrogated so many of them, let me ask you, Pilate, what did you think? How did it happen? Pilate says, well, I heard the accusations. He said, I had a whole group of men up here, all of them religious leaders, telling me how bad Jesus was. They said that he was claimed to be a king. They said that he was going to take over uh, Rome. They claimed that he had I said he was going to destroy the temple in three days. He claimed to be a prophet, claimed to be a leader. They said all of this. And then I looked at Jesus, and he wouldn't even answer me. Boy, I marveled that he wouldn't answer me. So I went to Jesus, Pilate says, and I said, Don't you understand that I have power to put you to death? And I saw these flaming eyes look at me 
and say, I have, you have no power at all against me except to be given to you from heaven. I'm not good. You can't take my life. I'm going to lay it down. Pilate says, when I saw that, something inside of me said, this is not an ordinary man. He said, don't you hear? Pilate asked him, don't you hear all the things people are witnessing against you? And when I asked him that, he wouldn't answer. I came to this conclusion after interrogating him, questioning him, listening to every accusation there was against him, and I came to this conclusion. I find no fault in this man. Now you understand, every witness that we bring against Jesus testifies of the same thing. He is the Son of God. Now I go back to chapter 5, and I notice Jesus still isn't done. He says, you've heard, John. You've heard of my works. Now I want you to see there is a persuasive witness that really you're going to have to contend with. In verse 37, The Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And you have not his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent him you believe not. He says, if you want to know who else testified of me, the Father himself. Now, in two different ways, the Father testified. Obviously, at the baptism of Jesus, he heard a voice from heaven, and others heard it. This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. We know on the Mount of Transfiguration, only three people living heard that one. Same statement. This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. We know later, after the um, incident with Lazarus, the following chapter, he speaks to God and God says to him, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. But in that instance, people didn't detect exactly what was said. Some people heard it. Some people thought it thundered, but everybody knew something happened. Let me tell you that God still speaks today. John seven seventeen, Jesus said, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Now, doesn't it follow that if God gave us this book, and this is his truth. And there is no other way to know about God, who he is, or what he's like, or how to know him. He wrote the book. And he's the author. If I read that book, I believe God has enough ability to convince me that it's true. Amen. Now the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Some heard it thunder. Everybody doesn't know what this book is saying because it is spiritual truth. And unless you open your heart to it, doesn't make a lot of sense, but even the critics of this book cannot deny that this book is a lightning rod. Yeah. This book is thrown in the middle of their lifestyle, and it wreaks havoc, and they just cannot destroy it or get away from it. Hey, the voice of God still comes to a heart and says, here is the way, walk ye in it. Jesus told us in John 16, he said, right here, I'm now, I'm preaching, I'm doing these works, I'm on the earth. And you know, you think, boy, if I'd have just lived here when Jesus was here and seen him do the miracles, hear him preach the sermons, watch his life, boy, that would have been impacting. Somebody says, I don't believe anything that I uh, can't see. I mean, if I can't explain it, I'm not going to accept it. And yet, you'll take a brown cow, let him eat green grass, put out white milk, yellow butter, and you eat it, and it makes blue eyes, brown hair, and white toenails. Now explain that or shut your mouth, right? You don't accept anything you can't explain. There's many things in life you can't explain that you accept because they're so real. Hey, when God speaks to your heart, you can't explain it. The Spirit of the Lord comes and puts it on your heart. You need Christ. You're headed to hell. Your sin is wicked and Jesus loves you. Will you receive him? You can try to turn it down and you can. You can hear the voice and say no. And it may get quieter, but the voice of God is discernible in the sense that when God speaks, you know he does. Oh, it's not audible. You might get explain away an audible voice, but you can't explain it away when God deals in your heart. Jesus said, is it expedient for me to go away? Well, now, I'd love to have seen him here on earth and do his miracles. And boy, then I'd believe if I could see all that. No. He says, much more expedient for me to go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go into the Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. 
Do you realize when Jesus went away, he sent the Holy Ghost to live into the life of a believer, and you as a believer are the connection that the world has with the voice of God. I mean, they're not going to hear him speak from the clouds. They're not going to just lay in their bed at night and hear him having never had a contact with a believer. But as a believer, you are the connection. The Spirit of God lives in you. And you say, well, I don't know how effective I'd be at speaking to somebody about Christ. What if they ask me a question I don't know? The Holy Ghost knows the answer. Well, what if they bring up something about my own life? Well, they might bring up something about any of us. We're just sinners saved by grace, but let the Holy Spirit do the work. Jesus said, I have a greater witness. The Father will convince you who he is. Now, let me move on quickly. I want you to notice the last witness, and that is the prevailing witness. It's not unrelated to the Father, but it gets more specific in verse 39. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You know, they were claiming religion. The biggest enemy to the Lord Jesus today is not a drug addict on the street who's shooting heroin up in his veins. He doesn't care. He just wants another hit. He just needs to be saved. It's not somebody who's left a bar last night and this morning are wallowing in their own vomit after a night of sin. Hey, they're on their way to hell. They need Christ, but they're not the enemy of the gospel of such. It's those that are standing today perhaps in a pulpit, which they probably got rid of, and who just got through with a, maybe an entertainment session, and they get up and give you a little sermonette and tell you everything's okay, it's not a problem, everything's fine. Or they get up and say, if you'll just do your best, be kind to your neighbor, live a good life, throw a couple of bucks on the offering plate, and you'll be okay, that's the enemy of the gospel. Now, they claim the Bible. Oh, yeah, we use the Bible. Just, you know, Sermon on the Mount, be kind to your neighbor, do unto others you have them do unto you. Oh, of course, we don't believe the miracles are true. We don't think Jonah was really swallowed by a well. We don't believe in the flood. We don't believe in creation. But other than cutting half my Bible out, yeah, this is what we claim for religion. Jesus says, you're claiming the word of God. Go back and look in it. It has one message. It tells you who Jesus is. Now, let me say, John the Baptist had a powerful witness. He's an expert. He was a prophet, and yet he said Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, the works that Jesus did, you didn't see them with your eyes, but we got witness after witness after witness who says, nobody can do these miracles except God be with him. Even the enemies of Jesus said, I don't like him, I don't like his preaching, but yeah, he, he did a lot of miracles. Now, you can not believe that, and the Father comes and he speaks to your heart, and you can try to weasel out and say, well, I, I just don't believe this Bible's full of errors, doesn't have any problem, but this Bible is an impeccable book. It's a witness that will prevail today. You know, first of all, this book is authoritative. Even its enemies unwittingly recognize the authority of the Bible. You know what they'll do? They come up with a religious question, and out of one side of their mouth, you have to listen to, you know, uh, some person who thinks he's smarter than anybody in the room, maybe a talk show host or a, a news person or whatever, and they're, you know, talking about some religious uh, idea will come up or something of course a lot of times now it's abortion or something and they want to tie that to religion and they, they're the smartest person in the room and they'll say well you know here's my opinion for after all the Bible says this and it's wrong on this why did they bring the Bible up you know why because this book is authoritative they want to undermine the authority by the way they haven't been successful Psalm 139 verse 2 God says I have magnified my word above my very name. This book, you don't have to defend it. You just contend for it. This book is powerful. Well, we also know that the Bible is indestructible. Now, people have tried. I mean, people have done what they started way even back in Jehoiakim in the book of Jeremiah and before. Let's get rid of that book. There have been atheist, agnostics, whole societies set to try to either educate people away from it or to try to burn it, get rid of it out of society. Communism tried it, and it just made Christianity grow. The book is indestructible. We shouldn't be surprised. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, Psalm 119, 89. So you understand, this book is indestructible. This book is authoritative, and this book is absolutely impeccable. I mean, when I say it's impeccable, I don't fear to hold it to that standard. 
There is not an error, inconsistency, contradiction anywhere in this book. You say, well, that's easy for you to get up and say. I mean, plenty of people have proved errors. You know, have you ever heard anybody say that? There's a bunch of errors in the Bible. Then follow it up with this question. Show me one. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a few people who are educated above their uh, intelligence that will say, oh, well, let me point you over here. And some of the stuff they come up with, you would not hold any other book to that type of a credit, uh, to standard. And even so, they're still wrong. And yet, the book has been attacked and brought up. Enemies have shot at it, and it still stands. Oh, but there's so many errors in it. Well, you know, if there's so many, why don't they get one or two unquestionable, nothing that we could even possibly answer? For instance, over in the book of Matthew, believe it or not, this is one that like, this I've heard brought up. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your closet, pray in silence. Over in the book of uh, 1 Timothy, he says, men pray everywhere holding up, holding up holy hands. There's your contradiction. I mean, isn't that obvious that God couldn't have written both of those passages? Now, you have to set up two nights to think of that. I mean, obviously, there's one context and a group of people he's speaking to in one passage for a certain purpose. I mean, the book is not just a book of proverbial sayings. It's a book that has a message from God, and he clearly was speaking to a certain group of people with a certain emphasis in one, and the other, he's speaking to the church. I mean, it's, it's not even a contradiction. It's, it's laughable to think that's the type of thing they're, they're offering. But listen, if there is a clear, not one like that, but a clear mistake in this book, then I challenge the enemies of God to publish it, put it out there, don't just shoot like a shotgun, narrow it in and say, here it is. If there's just one, God doesn't make any mistakes. Well, people have been trying that for a long time, and they just haven't done it. Oh, somebody might bring up this little thing, this, but nothing provable in a court of law that you could un just clearly verify. Now, that in itself is amazing. The book is impeccable. I mean, not one jot or tittle shall pass till all be fulfilled. Now, this book, and of course, we could go on talking about its character and its credibility. But you know, the biggest and most powerful thing about this book is its content. You know, we could analyze it from a grammatical standpoint. You can analyze it from a historical standpoint. It'll always rise above, but we don't even have to do that. What makes this book powerful is its content it reveals the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jesus said, search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. They testify of me. You know, back in um, the 90s, many of you would remember this, some of the younger people wouldn't, O.J. Simpson was put on trial. Now, DNA was pretty new in the 90s. Everybody didn't know what exactly that, how that worked in forensics and so forth. And you know now a little bit more that it's even more accurate than a fingerprint, that your DNA would match. It's like one in 40 billion or whatever that you would match if all the things come together. Certainly at least as good as a fingerprint. But nobody knew a lot about it. But they brought up and basically brought up evidence and said, uh, you know, here's a bloody glove, a bloody knife, a body with a hole the same size as the knife, hands around the neck with prints from this glove. I mean, it was like... Okay, and then you've got O.J. Simpson's body with this blood on it, and here's the woman that died, and it's all the same DNA. And then they found him innocent. <laughs> uh, now, obviously somebody would have to look at that and say, they got him dead to rights, but I just don't believe it. You have to choose not to believe. And I'm not dealing with the innocent or guilt of O.J. Simpson. That's not my point, even though it seemed very obvious to me. But the point is, what's more obvious than the guilt of O.J. Simpson is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And there's far greater consequences to rejecting that than to rejecting some human court scene that might take place. First of all, if you don't know him today, you know about him, you're familiar with him, you might even pay homage to him, but have you personally received him to be born again? If you haven't, you've got to receive him. Many of us are believers. We know Christ today. Do you realize the Christ that we take to this world? We've got the truth on our side. We don't have to doubt. We're not on our own. God will vindicate it. The Bible will vindicate it. The Holy Ghost will vindicate it. 
Hey, Jesus is who he says he is. Let's have a word of prayer. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. We're going to pray. Why heads are bowed and eyes are closed, why no one's looking. You know, perhaps you're here today and you don't know Christ yourself. You've never received him. You know about him. You're familiar with him. But do you know for sure you're born again? Do you know that if you died today, you'd be in heaven? You say, I'm not sure about that, but I'm concerned about it. Now, I'm not going to embarrass you or point you out. You could even be in the overflow room. I can't even see you, but God knows who you are. But if you'd say, I'm concerned today about my soul, I'm concerned that I do not know that for sure, and I want you to remember me in the prayer. I'd love to remember a raised hand in the prayer. I can't save you, but I can certainly pray that God would deal in your heart. If you're concerned today and you'd allow me to pray for you in that way, would you slip a hand up that I might pray for you? Anyone like that at all? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. As a believer today, you know Christ, you're on your way to heaven. And I don't know that God may have dealt with you about an area of surrender in your life today. I mean, he is the son of God. He demands and certainly deserves our all. Maybe he's spoken to your heart today as a believer and dealt with you and you'd say, there's a need there and I want you to remember me in the prayer. I know I'm saved, but God's spoken to me. There's a need. Would you pray for me? Would you slip up a hand that I might pray for you today while heads are bowed? Thank you. You can take that down. Thank you. I see that. Yes. God, we ask you to work in every heart. You know the need. You know precisely where people are today. If there are those without Christ under the sound of my voice, I pray that you would deal in their heart. If we can't practically get with them today, perhaps over the Internet or whatever it might be, lead very clearly that they might come to receive Christ today. And even in this service, if there are those without you, we might get a chance to take a Bible and show them how to receive the Lord. Lord, we pray for believers today. A couple of folks raised a hand, said remember them in the prayer, and there might be others who have real areas of surrender that they need to give to you. Uh, areas in their life that are displeasing that they might be able to see their testimony be more what it ought to be. Give them help and grace. Work now, we pray in the invitation in Jesus' name. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, no one looking around. If you're here without Christ today, I would invite you to meet me here at the front. I've got folks prepared with a Bible to take you aside and show you how to receive Christ today. You just meet me here and we'll know who you are. As a believer, if you need to find a place of prayer, I'd invite you to come. Whatever that area God may be dealing with you about, you surrender it to Him. God spoke and you come as our instruments play. Amen, amen. You can look this way. I appreciate very much your being in the service this morning. We'd invite you to be with us again tonight at 6 o'clock for our evening service. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our service in prayer. I'm going to ask Eric Weatherington if he'll close us. Lord, we thank you for the witness of your word, for Jesus Christ who came and gave himself upon the cross to die so that we might have forgiveness of our sins. If we just simply put our faith and trust in him. We pray that uh, that message of the gospel of Jesus Christ would be with us as we go from this place today. That we would share uh, the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone that we come in contact with. Keep us safe as we travel home and bring us again back tonight to gather to fellowship and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.